I believe that God has also positioned many of us who have had many experiences of overcoming to encourage others around us. So there are some things that I have learned, not simply by process, personal process. There are some things I've learned because I believed in the witness or testimony of those who were significant in my life. I have certain people that I allow to speak freely into my life. And because of their witness, there are some things that I just don't have to experience. I don't have to go through. There are some things that I just don't have to experience. I just don't have to go through. There are some things because I listen to their wisdom, their experiences that I just don't have to go through. I don't have to experience. And so I don't know how many people around you, perhaps you want to tell them now that there is no other way. <laughs> I pray that they would take your word to be true and they would try to avoid the pitfalls that are associated uh, with our not listening to God and to the voices of those that he has positioned in our lives. How many believe that God positions people near you? God positions people. God positions people in your life. He positions people in your life. Some, some, some will stay longer than others. Some, some are there for a short span. They are just temporary people to give you some permanent help. They are just temporary people but their advice will help you throughout the course of your life. And so you got to make sure that you aren't keeping temporary people in permanent places. And make sure you're able to know the difference. Because some things you discard might be the very blessing that God sent to you. Uh, may not come robed in the way you think. It may not come cloaked in the way you think. Uh, your six foot two may come five foot nine. Yeah, 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 Y'all just missed that. Y'all just missed that. Yeah. Y'all just miss your six foot two may come five foot nine. Your dream of driving a Mercedes may look like an old Pinto. And they don't even make them no more. But you got to be careful that you don't discard based upon your warped sense of desire or impulse. <laughs> There's a word that God wants me to share with you today. Uh, this word has been formed in my spirit out of our theme for the month. And it's a shame that a lot of you don't even know the theme for Grove for the month of May, but I'm not gonna ask because I'm not gonna wanna get upset. The theme for the month of May is really pursuing abounding joy. Abounding joy. Uh, it's enlarging, it's increasing, it's overtaking. And I want to share with you uh, in our scripture reading today, as we focus this month of May not only on the pursuit of abounding joy, but also recognize that the month of May is the observance of National Military Appreciation Month. We salute, we honor for those of you who are dependent, those of you who are veterans, those of you who are retired, those of you who are active duty military. Thank you for your service. As I press into the word of God this afternoon, May is also the month of mental health awareness of not covering up, not sweeping under the carpet, not mislabeling different people and making them feel inferior because of their mental challenges, 
their depression, but finding ways to help them manage and live a superior life in God in spite of their conditions. A lot of things in church we need to rebuke, but there are some things you can't rebuke. You simply have to retrain or work with what you have and then move forward. So I want to share today in two verses in Hebrews 12, the New Living Translation. I ask that those of you who are viewing live will share with us if you're able to stand at home or you're viewing this particular sermon, stand with us, you are in worship with us. In pursuit, in pursuit of in pursuit of abounding joy. Verses one and two. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now, say now, he is seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. He is seated in a place of honor, not in his father's seat, but beside his father's throne. I, I want to lift um, in this time of hearing, we do this by keeping eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. I want to talk for a few moments simply, don't take your eyes off the prize. Tell your neighbor, don't take your eyes off the prize. Yeah, you may take your seats for a few moments in our hearing. Uh, I want to I want to lift this particular sermon for those of you who are interested, uh, for those of you who have a desire for personal transformation. Uh, that is this particular text. The writer he offers us inspiration, motivation, and encouragement by letting us know that the race we run is not one that we run alone. He reminds us of the forerunners, the ancestors who prayed and paved the way through many tears, blood and sweat. We have had people in our family lineage but especially in the lineage of Jesus, who had some plighted paths, but yet the Lord used them to bring honor and prestige to another generation. I want you all to pray with me, because I'm going to take this series on joy. The writer encourages us, he inspires us by cataloging in Hebrews 11, 
we call the Hall of Faith, he lists a lot of individuals who have shown their faithfulness to God. They were flawed, but forgiven. They were examples of failure, but also recovery. In Hebrews 11, it goes to a litany of names about people who struggled to express their God-given nature. They experienced difficulty, but they waged war against the opposition and found victory. Amen. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Are y'all still with me? <laughs> Hebrews 12, verse 1 talks to us about the list of people they just named. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded, y'all help me, by such a huge crowd of witnesses, people who have endured hardships and embarrassment, people who had been given an assignment but got detoured by their natural impulses. Therefore, since we are surrounded, there, there's a multitude, a huge crowd of people, of examples. They are people who tried the faith and people who endured. People like Hannah, who prayed and believed God in years of barrenness, but then the Lord in due season gave her the ability to conceive and bear a child. There is Rahab, who is in the lineage of Jesus, who made it clear unto us, you don't have to have a perfect past to live in a noble future. For Rahab was a known prostitute who sponsored her house to secure the safety of the spies sent in to survey God's territory. And when the enemy came in, it was Rahab's house. Ooh. It was the prostitute's house who recognized Y'all got to help me today. Y'all help me. It was, it was the prostitute's house. Sometimes the Lord will save those who recognize they have greater need rather than those of us who feel privileged and that God owes us something. Y'all got to help me. This, this Rahab was one who now stands in a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. Samson, who was given unusual strength uh, to conquer those who had physical strength. But Samson, being a Nazarite, understood that God gave me what he didn't give others. He gave me strength. But Samson could not keep himself. He, he laid his head in the wrong person's lap. I just want to encourage you, don't lay your head in the wrong person's lap. Samson lost his hair, he lost his strength, and he was delayed in his mission. Samson could have lived longer, but because he allowed the cunningness of, of this woman named Delilah to mesmerize him, he allowed his strength to evaporate, his eyes to be put out, and then he was incarcerated in a place that he never deserved to be in. I just need y'all help today because sometimes we are in places we ought not be. <laughs> Simply cause, because we could not control the nature of our impulses, our passions, our desires, 
I know you don't think I'm talking to you, so just keep looking straight. So no one would ever think that I'm addressing this to you. But the fact of the matter is, all of us have different levels of temptation. And all of us have different things that would tempt us. Oh, I often tell the story of how this pastor would always declare how holy he was and how long he was married because he never messed with another woman inside of his 40 years of marriage. And then one day I found out why he saw me and it was then Tower Mall and I didn't wear glasses then. He looked at me and he pulled down his glasses and he said, Marina, you got some pretty eyes. It, 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 it was then that I found out why he had a testimony that he didn't bother women because he liked men. We all have our temptations. We all have the things that will pull at us, things that we simply chase. I, I, I share this with you and I'm taking my time for a moment because um, there's, there's something significant in this text, in this verse one. It says we have this great crowd of witnesses who, who are bruised but better, people who, who have gone through and they have tested the waters and they look back and they tell us, you can make it. They tell us that no matter, no matter what others have said about you, no matter if they approve or disapprove of who you are, you can make it. But I, I want you to be careful because, because some of us have a tendency of wanting to be like other people. And I want to caution you because I've heard for years, I want to be like Mike. I, but I wish I had Beyonce's money. I wish, I wish, I, I wish, I, 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 I wish I, I had things that they had. Many of us, I, I wish I was like Mike. But you got to be careful who you say you wish you were like. Because you might see all their glory, but you might not understand their full story. And, and so looking and, and looking and examining this first verse, I need for you to help me because in this first verse, it talks about this great crowd of witnesses that you and I need to understand that God does not want you to make the witnesses your goal. He does not want you to see them where you stop seeing him or yourself. God says they are simply witnesses. These are people who become your benchmarks. But, but they are not the end result. You, you want to be like Mike, but you got to go through Mike issues. You just can't have his fame without going through the shame. You, you can't want to just be other people because then you lose your original intent and purpose. I, I know you got some flaws, but so do they. I don't care who they are, bishop. I don't care who they are, reverend. I don't care who they are, doctor. It doesn't matter who they are. But you are not want to be like somebody outside of Jesus. Because he's the only one who died and got up and stayed up. The rest of us are trying to get it together. And no matter how righteous we think we are, if our walls could talk, if you could look and hear the doorknobs of GD, TD, Jake's house or my house or somebody else's house, you would find out I can't be them. Because I don't know what them go through. Y'all gotta help me. Y'all help me get this thing done. Let me three more marin a minutes and I'll be done. It, it, God, God is not saying that he wants you to, to, to simply make them your all in all, your everything. He's saying, I want them to be your witnesses. I, I need for them to be your examples of how to get up and get back in. I need for them to be your examples of how to put their confidence in me. I need for them to be witnesses who are under oath, tell the truth and nothing but the truth that I would have fainted. Y'all help, help me. That I would have 
fainted unless I believe to see the goodness of the Lord that this comes out of the lips of King David who had everything but then recognized everything on earth does not mean I got everything I need. I would have fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. So listen to me. Don't, don't, don't let anointed folk fool you. Everybody anointed got some stuff. Okay, y'all didn't, y'all didn't want to hear that. This y'all didn't want to hear that. This y'all. everybody anointed. See the higher degree of your anointing, the more stuff you got to deal with. To whom much is given, I need a praying and praising church today. To whom much is given, much is required. The higher you are nodding, the more hell you got to go through. Y'all, 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 y'all just sit down. Y'all just sit down for a minute. I got this, 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 God, God doesn't want you to change being original to become a duplicate of somebody else's life. Matter of fact, they can't distinguish you from them because you make them your goal rather than your benchmark. Every witness on a stand does not stay on the stand long. When the prosecutor or defense attorney is finished with them, the judge then say, you may step down. You may return to your seat because the testimony you've been given, you're on the oath, is nothing but the truth. And therefore, after you give your truth, you step down. There are no witnesses who will always be around other than Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Everybody else who gives a testimony at some point must step down. So if you make them your all in all, if you make them your God, when they step down, you lose focus of truth. Oh God, y'all please help me in the house today. This, this, This is something that's unraveling to us. Because God then lets us know that but they are they are just people, a crowd of people who have experienced and endured and persevered and gone through. These are the people that you learn from. And then it says, once you learn from them, the first thing you do is strip off every weight that slows you down. That means God says you got to identify the things you don't need to climb your mountain. My God, you're trying to carry too much stuff. You're trying to carry stuff you needed in the valley up the mountain, but you don't always need the same thing on the mountain you had in the valley. The valley stuff is no longer needed on the uh-huh. Are y'all praying with me? I'm going to get y'all out. Y'all, y'all don't seem too happy today. I'm going to, y'all don't. Right. So the same stuff you don't need, you got to learn to strip some stuff. What do I need to get rid of? Okay, let's be truthful. Who? Because most of our issues are really relational. Who do I need that's speaking a negative word in my ear? Who in the hell is trying to whisper bad news in my spirit? I got a boom. Uh, y'all. And so this word, this word, this word, y'all, this word says you got to strip off. And then it says run the race with endurance because you don't know how long it's going to be. So run the race with endurance because every race is not a sprint. There are some long distance races, some marathon races, and you just can't get tired unless you confuse the marathon with the sprint. 
It says run with endurance, preacher. It says run the race that God, that God has, oh, I wish I had time today, that God has set before you. I wonder how many people have truly found out the expression of their divine purpose while you are now living. It's dangerous to die and not, never know who you were, never knew what you were able to do. It's dangerous and sad to go to your go to your grave with all of this potential. Man, I gotta, come on y'all. So, so therefore the word of God says that we ought to make sure that we run this race. Then it says, verse 2, we do this by keeping our what? Come on, by keeping our what? Eyes on who? Keeping our eyes on who? So stop looking at the preacher. Stop looking at the bishop. Stop looking at, oh, 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 oh. Oh, stop looking at people you think are important and keep your eyes on why must I keep my eyes on Jesus because he is the lily of the valley he is the bright and morning star he is I am that I am he is El Shaddai Elohim why keep my eyes on Jesus he who was dead is now ever ever alive you know, I'm going to close man. I'm going to close the meal Y'all, why I keep your eyes on Jesus? I'm, I'm serious. I, I don't, there's no, I, I respect preachers. I don't like all of them. I mean, some days don't like me. Some days I look in the mirror, I don't like you. No, no. Okay, y'all. Some days I look in the mirror and I look in the mirror and say, I don't like you right now. So you know, if I don't always like me. Look at Costello, it's just mine. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I gotta finish, this, there's some things that I wanna talk about today and end with joy and happiness because this is where we're going for the month. So just give me a few moments and just, just bear with me. Because it says, but for the joy that was before him, Jesus endured the cross, listen, disregarding its shame. Perhaps many of us focus too much on the temporary and are not enough on the promise. I gotta end this note, and I didn't wanna really holler at the end because we have really redefined biblical terms. Etymologically, we have taken the words happiness and joy and made them synonymous. But happiness and joy are not synonymous. We live in a generation, if you were a baby boomer before, we had a generation of people who didn't seek much happiness, just peace. There's a generation now who's seeking happiness and will end up totally unfulfilled because you will never have total happy moments because happiness depends on, happiness is happening. I hear, and I, I hear people to say, say, I don't want a job that causes me stress. I just want to be happy and do my thing. I want to you know that happiness is overrated. And happiness is not going to give you fulfillment because happiness is based upon events, thoughts, people, and actions. Man, y'all can help me. Happiness is based upon places and if thoughts, places, and people shift, that means your happiness shifts. And whenever somebody tell you, all I want you to do is make me happy, you better rethink that relationship because they're gonna put more pressure on you than they put on God because no one in this world can make you happy. I need somebody to help me preach this thing. Nobody in this world will always make you happy. So therefore, you need more than just 
being happy over the events, over the people, over the places. Because if the people change, if the places change, if the thoughts change, you lose your mind. You lose your joy. You lose your peace. You lose your direction. You lose your comfort. You lose your dream. You lose your goal. You lose your hope. So if all you want to do is be happy, then your life is going to be totally unfulfilled. But if you want joy, what is joy? Y'all help me. Joy is a deep-seated pleasure drawn from spiritual realities. That's why Nehemiah said, he said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Not the people, not the events, not the situation, not my money. I've learned that I can have joy without money. But I need money to be happy. But I don't need money to have joy. I'm going to close and I just didn't want to rush this thing today. So y'all, 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 y'all rush me, but it's all right because it's time to go home. What is, what is joy versus happiness? Joy and happiness are not synonymous, church. And there are too many believers and churches are just seeking being happy. All I want to do is just be happy. I just want a happy marriage. I just want a happy relationship. That's, that's, not, that's not reality. It's not real. Are y'all you listening to me? But joy is real. So joy is a deep-seated pleasure drawn from spiritual realities. Joy is the depth of assurance that cannot be easily uprooted. It is deep down sense of knowing that God got my back and God is going to change the outcome. It may not be what I want it to be. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I got joy. Weep it endures for a night. But if I get through my night, joy cometh in the morning. What the devil meant for evil, God turned it around and meant it for my good. All things work together for the good of those who love the Lord and call according to its purpose. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, come against me to eat of my flesh, they shall stumble and fall. I got joy to endure the hell of this life. Oh, God, I've time to go. I'll come back next week. This joy we're talking about. Because joy, joy does not have a, joy has a threshold. Joy reveals renewed revelation. Joy gives you a different perspective than happiness. Joy says, I know you're crying, but believe I got power to wipe your tears away. Joy says, I'm going to allow you to go through this, but I will not allow your joy to be depleted, your peace to be depleted, your dreams to be depleted, because joy holds on to dreams. And if you want to have a depression or permanent depression-proof life, you got to make sure you don't look for happiness only, you seek joy. See, joy said when all hell breaks loose, you still have a determination. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. See, when you got joy, you will say, even though I'm beneath, I still know I'm above. Even though you are last in line, you will still say out of your spirit, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Oh, God. I'm going to come back next week. I got to finish this thing on joy. I got to finish this thing on joy next week. Can I come back next week and finish joy? I'm, 
I'm going to bring back Minister, Minister Booth. I'm going to bring back Minister Jamie and Pastor Omar next in a couple of weeks. Y'all can have them in a couple of weeks. But I got to make sure that you get this thing between happiness and joy. Because if all you want is happiness, you're going to drain the hell out of some people. If all you wanted to be happy, I can't send you flowers every day. But I can tell you from the joy of my spirit that you add value to my life. Oh, God help me. Pastor Bonds, as I close this word today, I just want to introduce you all to something that you should be looking for. That's joy. The story that I've been told. I want to conclude today with this. So remain standing with me if you can. I want to close with this. The story of three young plowmen entered a contest to win who would ever plow the straightest pharaoh or trench. These three men started out plowing at the end of the day the judge came to one and said, young man, what were you looking at when you were plowing? That young plowman said, I, I kept my eyes on the handles. The judge said to him, oh, I see now. That's why your line is crooked. Because you always look down. You always looked at where your feet were, but you never saw where you were going. That judge finished with him. He went to the second young plowman and said, young man, what were you watching when you were plowing? The young plowman said, I, I kept my eyes on the other two fellows. I watched them plow the field. The judge then said, oh, I see. That's why your line is crooked. Because you measure yourself by watching other people and never did the thing God wanted you to do. Well, well, there was a third plowman. That third plowman finished and the judge asked him, what did you keep your eyes on? What were you watching when you were plowing? That, 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 young, that young plowman said, I kept my eyes between the two donkeys. Okay. I'm in church. It's in the Bible. I kept my eyes between the two jackasses. Uh, it's in the Bible. Don't look at me. It's in the Bible. I kept my eyes between them so as not to lose sight of where I needed to be. And between those two donkeys, I saw a tree straight ahead. And I felt if I just kept myself between the left donkey and the right donkey and kept myself aligned to the tree. That judge said to him, oh young man, well done, well done. You didn't look down, you didn't look to the side, your right or left, you look straight between the two donkeys. Sometimes you gotta take your eyes off of the donkeys around you. <laughs> that, that, that's what I really wanna get to. find out, Lord, how can I draw my straight line? He won that contest because he stopped looking down and he looked up. He stopped looking to the left and the right because they could not draw his line. So neighbor, you can't draw my line. You can't make my trench. You can't take my dream nor my vision. You can't take my hope from me. The joy I have, you didn't give it. And I can't allow you to take it away. 
I'm going to draw my line toward Jesus, the author, y'all come on, and the finisher of my faith. If he can't get me there, I know you can't. So help me praise my Jesus, for he's been good to me. Church, I bid you farewell today. I bid you farewell today. I bid you farewell by high five somebody and say, neighbor, I'm doing my thing God's way. Tell us a neighbor, I'm doing my thing the way God told me. May not look like yours, but that's so quick, ain't you? Because I am a walking, talking, breathing, living miracle. Thank you for joining us for today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. Become a transforming partner with us. You can give at grovechurchva.com backslash giving or by texting your gift amount to 757-453-4373. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more messages that will inform and impact your life.